Gold here, and I'm going to be going over the five-game main slate here on Thursday. So just a, a short little, um, you know, early evening slate again. Once uh, similar to yesterday, do have a 6:40 start over here in Detroit. So keep that in mind if you're building teams tonight. Um, now something that we get on occasion. Um, you know, we'll get just kind of the uh, how the schedule pans out sometimes. Um, we get some slates that don't have any pitching whatsoever, and then we get slates like today where we have all the pitching in the world. Um, in both cases, I think it, it makes for interest, interesting tournament decisions because you got to deal with ownership for sure, and you got to – you know, deal with uh, coming in underweight or overweight on certain arms and et cetera, et cetera. And um, really it makes for some fun tournament play. And unfortunately, from an offensive standpoint, when you got a lot of arms on the mound like this, they're difficult to target and difficult to want to go after because the numbers are all always going to tell you that, uh, well, we don't like going after Garrett Cole. We don't like going after McClanahan, you know, things like this. Um, perhaps some exploitability in in some of the more granular numbers that we could we could pick out here. Uh, in the early going, we've got projections loaded to the site for the main um, for fantasy points and ownership, of course. So keep an eye out for this as the the models uh, adjust throughout the day, and we'll be pushing updates as as they come in. Cole up here at 11-2, similar to the early slate where Otani was 11-1. Cole gets a, I would say, a more difficult matchup. Um, and he's really seeing probably the ownership that, that Otani should be seeing on the early slate. But 45% uh, here, I mean, it's fine. He's, he certainly has you know 45 point upside. Um, he could still strike out 10 here in in six innings if he's really feeling it he could also give up four runs and strike out five in in five and a third or something like that um there's some variance with cole a little bit he does give up power to left handers still and does give up some homers to to the left side still so you can if you want to get off of some of this ownership i mean you're not playing it because it's a terribly equitable spot necessarily um if you want to get off of some of this ownership you could play a, a cheap robbie grossman or a travis jankowski or something like that up at the up at the top um that would be pretty much the only reasonable play i would i would assume um maybe a brad miller uh, or something like that super up the board super deep tournament play um, but you don't really want to be playing Nate 4,700 for Nate Lowe. Uh, and that's his normal price tag. Now he gets a pretty well below average matchup in Garrett Cole on the mound. So, um, targeting Texas here is, it, yeah, it's kind of gross. Uh, we'll get into the games here in a sec. Uh, Clanahan just below him, 10,000. Similar pricing dynamic to Otani and Urias. We have 11, 2 and, and 10,000 here for McClanahan. Um, perhaps not seeing as much of an ownership, uh, as, as much ownership love as, as maybe he should, um, 20 to 25% here seems fine. It's generally a bad, pretty bad strikeout matchup, uh, against the White Sox, even though they have been dreadful to start the season. We'll get into McClanahan though. I think it's an interesting tournament play high medium projection so far for sure. Dylan Cease walks everyone always and he gets a pretty bad batted ball matchup um in tampa now tampa's lost two in a row somehow and it's almost like they're a normal baseball team um 9200 is an attractive price tag for him and i think some of the walks and um and, and problems there are a little bit priced in but uh, this is a bad batted ball matchup for sure Targeting a you know a high variance arm that throws a lot of pitches because he walks people in a really good offense. Um, 
you know, this is an interesting tournament spot for sure. There's upside definitely because we saw that Hunter Brown really took apart the, the Rays yesterday. Uh, he was fantastic. Um, C certainly has that same type of upside. It's really the control that we're, uh, that we're worried about with him. Uh, Andrew Heaney, obviously high upside as well. Generally don't want to be going after the Yankees with lefties, number one, uh, or with lefties that have power problems, number two, um, or with lefties that only have two pitches, number three. So kind of a bad mixture here, and despite a 30% K rate for Heaney, and despite a, you know, to this point, underperforming Yankees lineup, they put up a pretty crooked number yesterday and jumped on Kenta Maeda. So um, maybe starting to see the baseball a little bit collectively and not a great spot for Andrew Heaney. So a lower median projection for sure, really just buoyed by the potential for all of these strikeouts when he does go off. But um, point per dollar and value metrics not popping at this price tag. Would like him much better if he were down here at 7,400 like a Kyle Gibson. Uh, he gets Detroit, good matchup for him. I think... I mean, he's got a higher median projection. He's $1,000 cheaper than Heaney and coming in the same ownership level. So seems like a uh, pretty standard pivot play to me. Um, Tyler Molly gets the Royals. He's not been great to start the season. High, high upside spot here for him. 8000 very attractive price tag. Naturally seeing a lot of ownership come in on him. Joey Lucchese was really good in his first start uh, coming off of I mean, what, two years nearly at TJ? And I think it was TJ. So he was uh, he was excellent in his in his first outing um, for the general upside that Lucchese offers. But he went seven innings, and he struck out nine against the Giants. I mean, th that's kind of an outsized performance for him. Um, can't really expect him to be that good because as a starter, we haven't, we haven't seen him – you know, on the mound, I mean, he took the entire 2022 uh, season off, and I guess half of the 2021 season as well for Tommy John. So um, good to see that he was very, I mean, he, he just came out firing, and he tore through the Giants, did walk to, but whatever, you're going to a full seven innings, giving up four hits and, and striking out nine, who cares? Um, so gets a good matchup here again at 6400 He got a $1,000 price bump. And a little bit worse matchup at it ball-wise. Um, Washington going to strike out a little little bit less. We'll get into that as well. Probably not going to be playing Granky or Trevor Williams or Joey Wentz on the mound. So let's just get into the games. Try and keep it short here. And we'll start with Baltimore and Detroit. Uh, as we talked about, Kyle Gibson, 7400 Nice price tag and a nice matchup. He gets the Tigers, who are bad. 25% uh, aggregate K rate so far, 8% walk rates average, 67 WRC plus. That is 33 points below average. So not good here for Detroit still. Um, Javi Baez got hit in the hand yesterday. So he came out of the game early, might not be in there today. Um, you know, despite Javi not being the same Javi as a couple of years ago, um, he is hitting for a, a little bit more contact this season, not striking out nearly as much. It's kind of freaking shocking, to be quite honest. Um, in any case, he might not be in the lineup, and that's kind of a downgrade. I mean, even though Javi, from a strikeout standpoint, has always been an upgrade for any opposing starter, um, maybe not so much. So, you know, it's a, I mean, it's a downgrade for the Tigers. Maybe it's an upgrade for Kyle Gibson in that he gets more higher strikeout guys, like a Riley Green, who's striking out a 40% clip so far this year, or something like that. Um, they do have McKinstry up at the top of the lineup, 2,500 leading off. That's probably fine. Kerry Carpenter is still cheap, probably, certainly the most raw power from the left side that they you can get to Kyle Gibson with, and that's how we mostly want to attack him. 267 average, 347 Woba, and a 184 ice over his last 200 innings against lefties. I mean, it's 85 and two-thirds against lefties, but 200 aggregate innings. Um, so some susceptibility there. Just a 17% strikeout rate, pitching to a lot of contact to the left side. Higher walk rate, and you know it doesn't really translate necessarily to power over the wall. But uh, definitely attackable from the left side. If you want to get to some short 
Tiger stacks uh, or Tiger's pieces targeting a, a cheap McKinstry or a Nick Maton who has righties with a lot of power. 2,800, he's fine too. Kerry Carpenter, as we talked about. Um, 3,000 flat for him. Akil Badu, heavy fly ball hitter. You can get to some fly ball hitters against Kyle Gibson because he's got this one and a quarter ground ball to fly ball. It generally tends toward some more line drives and, and balls in the air and, and over the wall when we target that sort of batted ball uh, matchup. So that's really how we want to go after him, mostly mostly with the uh, left side uh, of the plate. With the right side, he's a little bit better. Still pitch, you know, tosses to some average here. 263, 317 Woba, that's a little bit better because the walk rate's lower. 160 ISO. So nothing super impressive there, but a 23% K rate, that's about average as well. Um, control has always been good for Kyle Gibson. He'll float the sinker, however, and that's what keeps him up in the strike zone sometimes and what gets him really beat up when he puts up a, a real stinker. Um so, but it's not walks, and it's not necessarily getting on the barrel with a lot of hard contact. It's just floating what is overall a very high variance pitch in the sinker number one, just as a as a pitch itself. And his sinker individually uh, is dead break even value relative to the rest of the rest of the league. So, not all that great. And if he's floating this, uh, you could see some some power. Uh, emerge from a couple of these Tigers lefties over here would not be all that surprising. That said, nice median projection so far at 15 and a half. It's a good matchup because they're still going to strike out a crap load. Uh, 15% ownership. I think this is very playable and it's going to keep his ownership down despite getting Detroit because we got so many other good arms on the mound. Uh, so if you want to include him in your tournament pools, I think this is perfectly fine. You could keep, you could see six innings out of Kyle Gibson here and six or seven strikeouts. I think that's perfectly reasonable. Now, where we want to be careful is this is back-to-back -back starts for him against Detroit. They did just see him five days ago. So we want to be careful with that. And in most scenarios, we want to side with the offense because they just got a good look at him. And even though he took him apart in six and a third for 11 Ks, He's probably not going to be able to do that again. So uh, this is the Tigers. They are bad. But we can, I think, play both sides here and expect some regression in that 6 and a third 11 k outing. Did walk three batters. But Detroit is so hapless that they can't, you know, they swing and miss so much that they couldn't really take advantage of any of that. So um, there's still going to be a lot of variance with Detroit, of course. And let's see what we're getting them in the betting market. It's plus a quarter right now. Not super thrilled with that. Uh, you got to lay three to two on Baltimore. And that seems um, like probably the side we'd want to get to. But don't be shocked here if Kyle Gibson uh, gets beat up a little with Detroit having seen him just five days ago. Uh, I think it's I think you can play both sides here and maybe come in a little bit over this 14, 15 percent ownership. But I wouldn't go super crazy with it. Um, as I mentioned in the last video, uh, with Kyle, or Kyle Gibson's last start, he's super enigmatic, and he's, he's really hard to peg because none of his pitches are really all that great. And they're all eh, just kind of marginal. He does throw a lot of them. Um, you know, full six-pitch mix here that he's mixing in. But it makes him difficult to go after sometimes. But if he doesn't have this sinker and he's just floating it, then the cutter and the four-seamer really aren't good enough. Change-up certainly is not going to be good in the event that he floats the sinker. Uh, and the slider is really just kind of marginal as well. He doesn't have enough with the other four or five pitches to really bail him out if his main pitch at 30% of his arsenal is floating and he's up in the strike zone. So um, even the hapless Tigers could do some damage today. Joey Wentz on the mound for Detroit, 5,100. I like this price tag. Now, I certainly hate the matchup. I, I don't like going after Baltimore. They've cooled off pretty significantly from their early season um, sort of flurry, I suppose. He, oh, I'm still on uh, Kyle Gibson. Let's get over to, I'm over here on the other monitor, um, getting to Joey Wentz. Um, in his last start against Baltimore, also five days ago, this is the exact same matchup. He only went four innings, got picked apart for about five earned, did strike out four, which is great, 
but you know, five earned runs is not great. So um, probably going to side with Baltimore once again here, even though I, I do like playing the opposite side of the regression train. When pitchers get picked apart by an offense and they see them shortly thereafter, I do like going to the pitcher. And we're getting him at 51 today. He got a $700 price drop in his last or from his last outing when he was 58 five days ago. So that's attractive. And he's got an okay pitch mix here, but similar to Kyle Gibson, uh, not a whole hell of a lot of value with any one of the pitches outside of the changeup. Changeup is pretty good, and he can neutralize some of this righty power over here. But we'll see what they want to do. They might be getting into their uh, let's lead off Ryan McKenna at the stone minimum shenanigans that Baltimore is wont to do sometimes. So um, Ryan Mountcastle been good, hitting the ball very hard, but... Not a lot of raw result to show for it just yet. Santander still very playable at 3,800, even though his price is coming up a little. Um, so these guys are going to be able to platoon. Ramon Urias, of course, multi-position eligibility in the middle of the lineup. James McCann against his old team, 2,600. Very playable catcher piece there. Probably see some ownership on him today. Um, Georgie Mateo, of course, down at the bottom of the lineup. And 5,600 for Cedric, unfortunately, in the nine hole. Even though he hits lefties all right, uh, he's an intriguing piece to to throw into a stack um, when he when he hits down here at a super expensive price because he's a good hitter. But 56 out of a nine hole hitter is kind of uh, well, it's it's very difficult to get to to say the least. Rutch at 51, you could play him as well. Righty is his natural side, of course, but um, just gets more abs from the left side and you know, naturally sees a little bit more production out of that side of the plate. But uh, you can play him from there. Don't don't shy away from that at all. But uh, Mount Castle here is a pretty damn good play. Wentz does struggle with the right side of the plate. 177 ISO, 227 average, not so much there. 315 WOVA, not so much there. 10% walk rate, a little bit there. And the swing and miss to the righties with a lack of a good four-seamer cutter mix here is leading to a good bit of contact. Full 80% from Wentz. And just an aggregate 19, 20% K rate. So uh, not super thrilled about going after Wentz from a fundamental and batted ball perspective against Baltimore. But 5,100 is 5,100. And if you need to get down here, you probably don't with so many very high upside arms on the mound. Uh, this is a five gamer. And you can really do whatever you want. And you can get different with it. And if you want to play the regression train for a pitcher as well, at 5100 this is a fine price tag to do it with. Projecting pretty damn well for somebody down here in this price range. 12 and a half so far. Uh, that's not bad. At, at 5100 if you can get 15, 18 points out of a guy, uh, you're, you're pretty stoked about that. So uh, 7% ownership seems about right. Um, we really don't want to be going after Baltimore in most scenarios. And still you're probably going to want to side with the offense when, when they get a pitcher and back-to-back -back starts for them. So um, siding mostly with Baltimore here, but I think you can play some Detroit pieces and you can mix in a little Joey Wentz if you want to. Okay, Washington and the Mets. Trevor Williams probably also not going to get here despite the fact that he's got fantastic numbers against righties. Look at these, like 213 average, 278 Wobe, and a 148 ISO with a 30% K rate from Trevor Williams. That is out of control good and however to the lefties he's very attackable 303 average huge number 361 woba huge number and a 191 iso huge number 1.6 homers per nine inducing some soft contact that's because of the changeup but the changeup really doesn't provide all that much value so it still gives up power even though he'll get some guys to roll over on it on occasion the breaking stuff and the off-speed stuff really not good and that's why he he still gives up a lot of power, despite a full 30% K rate to the right side of the plate. He doesn't walk people, but when he gets on the barrel and starts floating this sinker a little bit, which doesn't happen all that often, but the changeup will be bad, and he won't be able to get out of counts with well below average breaking stuff in the curveball and the slider. So, um, not great. Not a great secondary arsenal here for Trevor Williams, and he gets the Mets, even though they've been torn apart in the last two days by, like, Cy Young, JoJo Gray, and Cy Young 2, 
uh, Mackenzie Gore, who struck out 10 or 11 last night. Um, I think we can still get to the Mets here, and I don't want to get too concerned with their offense, even though they've been um, they've been torn apart, admittedly, you know, by the last uh, last couple of arms here. But uh, Trevor Williams still a significant weakness to the left side, and these guys are going to be able to platoon pretty well against him. Brandon Nimmo, Frankie Lindor, Jeff McNeil, Danny Vogelbach. Brett Beatty, Luis Guillorme, all hitting from the left side, all likely to be in the lineup today. And let's not forget that Starling Marte historically has hit righties a little bit better than he has lefties. And and you still got to get through Pete Alonso too. Um, if you want to play Met stacks, you got to pay for it. 46 for Nimmo coming up a little bit, 54 for Marte, 53 for Lindor, 61 for Pete Alonso. All the other guys are inexpensive and attainable. Jeff McNeil just kind of at a medium price tag, 4000 flat. But you can play the Mets here, and this is a day game over at City, uh, almost called it Shagan. <clears throat> um, 55, 60 degrees or so. Should be a good day for baseball. <clears throat> Excuse me. Should be a good day for baseball over here uh, tonight. If you want to get to some Mets stacks, they're probably going to be popular because everybody... We did, like we always stack against Trevor Williams because of these horrible numbers against lefties. Um, but he's had a couple of pretty okay outings this season so far. Serviceable, not so much for DFS. So we can't really get all that thrilled about playing him at 5,500 here. Uh, definitely in a, in a really bad matchup. Uh, but he went two Coors Field and survived five and a third. Just gave up two runs, struck out four against Rockies. Cleveland got to him a little bit. Obviously, a bad strikeout matchup there. Uh, Minnesota, a little bit better strikeout matchup, but he survived a full six innings, struck out four again. So the the raw K stuff is going to leave a little bit to be desired here at an aggregate 21%. Uh, that's because of the huge, huge delta because between rather the righties and the lefties. 30% versus 9% to the left side. I mean, that's just... That's something you probably aren't going to be able to overcome for too much longer. I think we want to go after some of the Mets here. We have to keep an eye on their ownership on a five-game slate. It's probably going to steam quite a bit. Definitely the lefties. Uh, really like Frankie Lindor at 5,300, however. You can play some Brandon Nimmo. He'll walk, get on base. He's got a eh, not so much stolen base upside, but um, you can turn the lineup over and and really get things going for them up at the top. You can always play Pete Alonso. Splits don't really matter with him. He's only got a 21% K rate to really both sides. A good hitter over here. And Danny Vogelbach, if you want to get off of the 6,100 from Alonso, you can play him at 2,300. That's fine as well. So um, you can piece together some of the Mets here. You're going to have to play some of the, the cheaper guys at the bottom of the lineup if you're full stacking. So I'm not super thrilled that we got to do that. And unfortunately, that would prevent us to, uh, from getting to a lot of the expensive arms like a, a Garrett Cole um, or a McClanahan uh, at the top of the pricing spectrum on the mound. So uh, Lucchese on the mound for, for the Mets, 6,400 as we talked about. He was excellent in his last start, struck out 11. Um, probably not going to be able to do that today. Here in the early going, look at this strikeout rate from the Nationals against lefties, 15%. 110 WRC+. plus. They've actually been like almost average 089 ISO. So they're not hitting for any power, but they got a 10% walk rate and a 336 Woba. No hard contact whatsoever. 60% nearly medium contact rate. That is, that's a huge, huge number. So these, this will normalize a little bit and you could see this K rate start to regress. It's not going to be 15% for the entire season uh, from a team that's not hitting for this really any power. Uh, won't be this low. Like you could see a full season's worth of 18 to 20 percent. Uh, the Dodgers have done that before. Cleveland, the the Mets themselves. Um, so it's it's possible. 15 percent though, pretty low. So you could see a little bit of regression in that aggregate number start today with Lucchese, who displayed some really damn good whiff stuff. Admittedly, it was against the Giants, who swing and miss off a tee. Um, Less of the the three true outcome type of guys over here. Uh, fewer, I should say, over on the Nationals than the Giants. So they're going to make a 
a good bit more contact in general. So not the greatest strikeout matchup, even if this is the Nats. 6400 still an attractive price tag, 33% ownership, not attractive at all. Um, high, high median projection so far, but we still we got to be careful with this because these numbers against lefties so far this year are pretty attractive. And at high ownership, if you want to take some leverage stacks and take some regression sort of type of shorts on, on Joey Lucchese, um, he still only had one start in the majors in the last two seasons coming off of TJ. Like, let's not get carried away here that he's one of the best arms in baseball. And this is a bad strikeout matchup. So um, is he going to strike out nine every start? Absolutely not. Could he strike out nine here today? Yeah, sure. But um, I'm not super thrilled about getting to this ownership figure. We saw last night with like a Steven Matz. Um, you know, some of these guys can get picked apart down here in bad matchups for them. So uh, they're not going to hit for a lot of power, as we talked about, but I think we can probably come down uh, and, and a little bit underweight. If we're building a lot of teams here, you're going to get exposure to Lucchese. There's just kind of no way around it at this price tag uh, and this projection. It, you're just going to have to do it. Um, but in the early going here, like we, we need to probably see a few more starts because uh, a full 1.2 Ks an inning or something is not who Joey Lucchese has been in the past. Uh, I don't think he's uh what's that kid from I forget the <laughs> the the golden arm movie uh, he played for the twins anyway um not sure he's just gonna have t j and it's gonna fix all of the uh the contact problems he had to write he's in the past so um do we wanna target him sure you could take some take some NAS plays. It's five games late. You can do whatever you want. These guys are very cheap. They're one of the stacks that could get you all the way up to two two arms, like a, a Garrett Cole and a McClanahan on the top um, of the pricing spectrum on the mound. Alex Cole, 2,500. Lane Thomas, 28. Jamer, who's been really good, mostly from the left side, but will hit from both sides. 31, that's fine. 3,400 for Joey Manessis. Now we're like, okay, this, this guy's got a lot of power, and 3,400 is a Damn good price. Keeper Ruiz behind the plate. He'll hit from both sides. 2800 for him. Stone Garrett. A lot of upside, speed, and power. 3400 that's fine. Of course, you've got the uh, the cheaper guys down at the bottom of the lineup. Uh, Michael Chavis, Victor Robles. They they called up Jeter, Jeter Downs as well. High, pros, high, high upside prospect for them. Um, so these are got, there's some playable pieces here for the Nationals if you want to go after some of this high ownership. It's likely to steam, to be quite honest. Uh, if you want to get to two expensive pitchers, this is one of the stacks that can get you there. So um, overall, would probably side with offense in most scenarios. Not to say that I don't like Lucchese at all. Uh, I do like the price tag here, and I certainly will have some, but not a probably not 35 40 percent of him uh necessarily even though the the projection is going to be kind of hard to get away from okay tampa and the white Sox, two real good arms on the mound here uh one of whom doesn't walk anybody and the other walks everybody uh mcclanahan doesn't walk anybody Ten thousand, good price tag for him and this is the same mcclanahan that we saw at the beginning of last season last year really for 60 70 percent of the season last year when he was leading the AL Cy Young race. Um, he looks fantastic again. He's been great. And in his last outing, he was a really good tournament play against these same White Sox. Six innings, struck out 10. The White Sox missing Tim Anderson at the top of the lineup. Now, he, they've been uh, pretty lackluster, to say the least. Um, against lefties, as a low strikeout team, or with as they have been in the past, they're still striking out at 25% clip so far. A 200 PA is a bit noisy of a sample here. Um, so we have to wait for this to flesh out a little bit more. 85 WRC plus, 155 ISO. Seems pretty much like par for the course for the White Sox. Um, missing Tim Anderson, they'll probably get him back soon. He's going out on a rehab assignment, I believe, this weekend. Uh, could be today, as a matter of fact. They... Nevertheless, they they won't have him back tonight. Uh, they'll have him back soon, and he'll solidify these numbers against lefties for sure. But it, it's not going to be today. I'm not sure I'd want to be playing him against 
Shane McClanahan anyway. Uh, you can play him again, but we also need to keep in mind that it, this is back-to-back -back starts for McClanahan. Just five days ago, saw the same White Sox team over here. So uh, this matchup, similar to the, the Gibson and Joey Wentz matchup, um, could see some quite different results compared to the uh, the first outing a few days ago. Um, we like the price tag, of course. 10000 is fine. Uh, it is a little bit elevated, at least compared to where he's been early here in the um, – here in the early going, I should say, 77 in his first start was basically free. Uh, 88, 95, 99, 96, now a full 10,000. So the price has been creeping up and does get, you know, the, a lineup in back-to-back -back starts. So we just have to be aware of that. Not that the stuff is going to tell us that there's a, a major vulnerability here. Every number that, that you find is pretty much fantastic. Um Throws a slider a lot, just neutral value on that particular pitch. Same thing with the four-seamer, but it's fine because he's got a good changeup, really good curveball. So a full three pitches that are plus value and plus plus in, in cases of the change in the curve. Um, and he's still got the slider as well. So all of this is fine. Suppression metrics are excellent. Strand rate probably a little high. Um, but that's because he's got such a high ground ball rate with such a good curveball and a, such a good changeup. So he's inducing a lot of ground balls and soft contact, getting guys to roll over on the baseball. So he's stranding a lot of runners. If we're looking for a regression, that's probably where it's going to come. Um, and letting some guys on base, but he didn't let guys on base all that often. 275 Woba, 244 Woba, two lefties and righties respectively. And these are great numbers. So... 30% uh, K rate, 16% swing strike rate, 17% called strike rate. I mean, the, one of the best CSWs you're going to find in baseball at a full 33% here. So uh, there's no fundamental problem at all. But if you want to take kind of a, um, a momentum play and just play some of the socks or at least fade McClanahan, seeing a lineup in back-to-back -back starts, sure. Uh, that's probably why we're seeing a bit depressed ownership on him and, of course, you know, Garrett Cole um, gets Texas, and it's Garrett Cole. But McClanahan's numbers are are better to both sides of the plate than Garrett Cole's are, even though the strikeout number, the raw K number, isn't quite as high. You are getting him 1200 cheaper. So I think this is a fine tournament play to go back to McClanahan. Uh, I would almost definitely, and probably in even considering the back-to-back -back matchup, 8-10 scenarios still side with McClanahan. I mean, this this lineup over here for the Sox is just really, really poor. I mean, they got Elvis Andrews leading off now, uh, again, in, in trying to sort of hold down the fort until Tim Anderson gets back. So they have plenty of righties, but, I mean, he's got a 31% K rate to the right side, sub-30% hard con, sub-28% hard contact rate, maybe a, leaving a little bit on the table and, and soft contact induced from the right side, but it's still a one and a half ground ball to fly ball. I don't really care. Two to one ground ball to fly ball to the lefty. So every number here from McClanahan is going to tell you to just play him. And I, I think the, both the projection and the ownership here are also saying that as well. Uh, like the price tag. And I like the, the discount off of Garrett Cole here. Um, Dylan Cease on the other side, same matchup as we've, said like four times today or something. Uh, he got picked apart pretty good. And this was in Tampa. He gave up three earned, struck out just five and only went four innings. Now, he only walked one batter, which is great, but that's kind of a an outsized performance him, an outsized performance from him because he's got a, a 10 and a half and 11% walk rate. He elevates his own pitch count. And this is why he can't go deep into games. You pretty rarely see more than a full six out of him um, you know, occasionally he'll pop for an eight or a nine or whatever, you know, like did that a couple of times last year, but only one, two, four, five, six outings last season of seven or more innings. Um, and that was in, oh, I don't know, a lot of starts. <laughs> so there's more variance here with Dylan C's and we're worried about pitch count. A, a little bit of that is priced in, of course, and he's still got the same 30% K rate to both sides of the plate, The it's it's the walks, and it's elevating the pitch count that get him in trouble. 
It's not that he's on the barrel or anything like that, so it's not like a, a Michael Kopech or a Lucas Giolito problem, um, or a Lance Lynn problem for that matter. It's just the walks. Excuse me. So 9,200, this is fine. Playing tournaments, go ahead. And because, as we saw yesterday, Hunter Brown tore apart the Rays here. Um, so they could be cooling off quite a bit here, and don't be surprised, given their real hot start to the season, if they start to regress and, you know, lose half a dozen in a row or something. Um, even though there's a real good baseball team over here, we don't want to count on or, or, or bet on teams, you know, good baseball teams losing a lot of games in a row, going on a huge losing streak or anything like that. But, um, you know, a 14 game win streak is also not sustainable, right? So, uh, We'll see that correct a little bit, and, you know, we had talked about the Rays just not being able to win every single game they play. Now, they've lost two in a row, so they may just, on a shorter time frame basis, kind of bounce a little bit and win one here um, if, if Dylan Cease is just walking the whole country. But, you know, now we're getting into some pretty speculative stuff. From a, a raw number standpoint, fundamentally, everything is great outside of the walks. The median projection is fine for somebody. is great for somebody at, at 9,200 here. And the ownership is fine as well. 25%, I think this is fine. Uh, we can play him and McClanahan in team. You can play him on the same team if you want. doesn't really matter. Um, because it's pretty unlikely that either of these guys are going to get super pieced apart. And you're, you know, having played both of them on, this, on the same team, that you're going to jeopardize yourself uh, four points for a win or anything like that. Um, most of the offensive production in most scenarios is going to come from the, come from the bullpens after these two guys are on the bench. So that said, I hate playing guys with high walk rates, uh, against good baseball teams. I just don't like doing it. Um, I don't really want to stack Tampa necessarily 5k for Yandy still yikes 59 for Wander for Wander Franco. He's back up to near 6,000 64 for Randy is kind of, kind of out of control. 55 for Brandon Lau still. Um, Josh Lowe down in the six at 4,500. I didn't know these guys have been good, but let's slow down a little bit on these price tags. So not crazy about stacking Tampa. Really don't want to stack the White Sox either. Cause I don't like going after all either of these arms, but you can, if I had to choose, uh, I would stack Tampa because of the walk rate. Uh, it, there's just so much more variance when you increase your pitch count like this. And he's much more likely to be out of the game early, um, because he's, He's throwing 100 pitches in, in four and two-thirds because he walked four guys or something. So um, mostly just pitching here, but some Tampa, probably no White Sox at whatsoever. I do like Aloy's price at 3,200. We're starting to get into uh, ridiculous territory with him. Um, so they've got pop, and sure, if you want to take a couple of pieces there, I mean, whatever. But um, I will probably be uh, staying off of it in most scenarios. I really like McClanahan. Don't really like Zach Greinke here. Uh, I like the Twins, and I think they might be starting to heat up a little bit. Um, I could, I, I mean, they've heated up like once this season, so uh, I could be blowing smoke up your ass here. But um, the, either way, you can't really play Zach Greinke, 5,800. He just doesn't have any upside in, in tournaments. Uh, it, like, he'll survive for four or five innings or, or whatever. He's frustrating to stack against in that he's just a, a pitcher anymore. He doesn't have overwhelming stuff. Um, he doesn't have overwhelming stuff for a high school staff. He's only throwing, you know, 87, 88 anymore. And a, with a 52 mile an hour curveball. Um, but he'll still go five innings, six innings. And he's done that in each of his five starts this year, five and a third, six, five, six, five, no strikeout stuff. He did strike out six in his start against Atlanta. It was kind of shocking. Um, Harkening back to the old Zach Greinke days, but you know he he survives and he doesn't get blown apart. He'll give up two, three runs or, or whatever, and and just go five innings, and you're banging your head against the wall every time you stack against Zach Greinke. But I do kind of like the Twins here. Uh, I'll probably still take shots. Um, that said, you know I don't like full stacks super often because I respect Greinke still, even though he's not throwing that hard. Uh, so. Probably short stacks for me from the Twins here. They're going to get played because they always get played. Uh, you can play some Georgie Polanco. He's an attainable price, 42. 
And Max Kepler probably leading off, 36. That's fine as well. Correa is 46. You can play him because he didn't strike out a lot. Buxton does strike out a lot, so not super thrilled about that, but he's Buxton. 5,200, that's a fine price. Trevor Larnick, probably not great here for him. Uh, he's a really good fastball hitter, but Zach Greinke <laughs> doesn't throw a fastball anymore. This is a perpetual changeup. Um, and he's got a lot of junk that he's throwing, so not a, a good you know, pitch mix matchup for Trevor Larnick. But you can get to all of these guys if you want. Like Joey Gallo, sure. Uh, he's not, like, he'll probably strike out more in this matchup than he should. Uh, but Joey Gallo strikes out way more than he should in every matchup. So there's that. Um, they're all playable, and they're at playable prices, which is probably going to increase their ownership down here. Um, that doesn't mean I want to take any Grinky pieces on the other side and, and play some. But uh, it, it takes me off of the Twins a little bit, probably just because their ownership is going to be so damn high. Tyler Molly's going to be pretty owned as well. 8,000 for him. 35%. I think this is fine. And he has not been great, as we alluded to in the opening, to start the season. Um, he's been getting hit around a little bit. His last outing was much better against Washington. Went six and a third. This is in that bad weather game, I believe. Struck out just four, though, in six and a third. Uh, we did talk about Washington being a little bit stickier this season, not striking out nearly as much. But in his first few outings, it really only his only good outing was against Miami in the first start. Went five, struck out seven. But then he got Houston and the Yankees, six innings, four and a third inning, struck out six and five there. So the K stuff is still there, but the suppression and the production is also still there. Uh, for the opposing offenses. Suppression, not there so much for him. Uh, gave up four runs against Houston, two against the Yankees, and when you're only going four and a third, striking out just five and giving up two runs, you know, that's not great for DFS purposes. So we have seen his price come down. Started the season to 82, popped to 9 and 10-1 in his next two starts, dropped to 87 against Washington. Now he's down at 8K in a really good matchup here. So... It makes sense that the ownership is is popping here really hard, and he's you're definitely going to want to get exposure to him. There's a lot more upside in the tank for Tyler Molly here. Um, Twins have a sneaky good rotation. I don't know if it's sneaky really. Everybody in baseball aware of what they got going on over here, but a lot of upside arms from their starters including probably a Bailey Ober, who they're going to bring up and take the place of a likely another DL stint for Kenta Maeda. Um, in any case, Tyler Molly here, medium projection, 18 points here so far, and high ownership, yeah, it's okay. I don't want to get 50-60% to try and get like mega leverage with Tyler Molly or anything like that, but this is a good matchup. And I think coming in, coming in anywhere around this figure, uh, I wouldn't, like deliberately try to come in at like 20% or 15% or anything like that. Um, I'd probably try to get closer to the field and I'd be happy if, if I got, you know, 45, 45% or so. Uh, I think this is, this is fine in a lot of scenarios. This is a really good matchup. The Royals have been dreadful uh, against righties this season, 26% K rate, not walking at all, 57 WRC plus. It's going to come up, and, it's, and it will regress, but uh, not sure Tyler Molly is the type of arm I want to look for that regression uh, for. 26% um, K rate to lefties, 24% to, to righties. Good contact numbers pretty much all the way around. Is susceptible to the right side a little bit. Uh, so if you do want to play some Salvi, some Bobby Witt, go ahead. 278 average allowed, 349 Woba, and a 202 ISO there. 32% hard contact on 1.8 homers per nine. So if it's anybody, it's going to be some of the righties over here that get to him. You could run like a, a short little three-man, like a, a Witt, a Salvi, and a Vinny Pascantino. All playable price tags. Probably a little expensive in general. If you want to throw in an MJ Melendez at 44, make it a four-man, that's fine too. Full stacks against Tyler Molly. You're looking for outlier performances, and I'm not crazy about that. Uh, so... Uh, but it's you know, it's five games late. You can do whatever the hell you want. Um, okay, let's uh, let's move on here and get to the last game: Yankees and Rangers. You got Garrett Cole here, 11-2. It's really just line of construction that's going to prevent us getting uh, a boatload of Garrett Cole here due to this median projection. 23 and a half is a huge number. 
45% given this median projection on a five-game slate. It's probably low, to be quite honest. Um, if you're just running teams, even with with variance, you're probably still going to get 75% of him, I, I would assume, um, in most scenarios. Even though this isn't the greatest matchup in the world, Texas has been heating up and, and seeing the baseball pretty well. They have really torn apart some bad teams recently. Uh, they had a an Oakland series, for example, where they just they scored 85 runs. Um, nothing wrong with Garrett Cole, of course, in the numbers. It's it's really just power to lefties that he gives up. He, he's got a homer issue a little bit. I mean, it's not a horrible number here because he's still got a 32% raw K rate. Um, that's great, but he does give up a 172 ISO and an 070 grab ball to fly ball. So he'll give up balls in the air with some hard contact, 36% on the barrel a little bit to the left side. So that's really the only thing that you would um, like to like outwardly target against Cole. Um, but the only thing, as I mentioned, that's going to prevent us from getting so much here is the price tag. It's not really the ownership. Uh, at 11-2, I think I'd probably rather, in in a lot of scenarios, get down to McClanahan at, at 10,000. It's just going to allow you to get to some of these other stacks that you probably do want to play, like Baltimore, like the Mets, um, and maybe some of the Yankees on the other side against Andrew Heaney. 84 on the mound for him. 15-point median projections. Fine for a guy in this range, generally. Ownership is would be attractive otherwise, but he's I don't like the pitch mix here. Slider's not very good. Four seamer is fine, but there's variance with him still, even though he's he's got a lot of K raw K upside. Um. In. Uh, let's see. I won't, uh, my website on the other, on the other monitor kind of crapped out, so don't have Andrew Heaney's um, results offhand. But uh, we know the K, the K stuff is there. 33% to both sides, um, or in aggregate, rather, 30% to both sides. It's the power to the right sides that, that's the problem. 33% hard contact, 1.9 homers per nine with a 222 ISO. So that's where it is. Yankees are still going to strike out a little bit against lefties, not so much as they will against righties, but a 23% K rate here um, against the Lefties here in the early going, 89 WRC plus, 16% walk rate, just 200 PA. So let's, uh, you know, not get too carried away, but uh, just a 109 ISO. This is a very low number for uh, the Yankees over here. And they're really not hitting for a lot of power yet. And unfortunately, they've got DJ. Like, I, I love DJ, uh, but at, at 4,000 or 3,700, he's not really the type of four hitter uh, you want in your, you know, championship lineup necessarily or what should be uh so they're still missing a lot of guys and we'll see what they want to do with the lineup they've been moving guys around trying to um trying to really get everybody going here judge got into a few balls yesterday went like two for three or three for four everybody in the yankees started to see the baseball a little bit um and sometimes that's all, that's all it takes to really get a lineup going so if you want to go after some heaney uh, I think that's perfectly fine. You can stack against him literally every single day with every single team in baseball because he's only got two pitches. I mean, he's got three, but you know, two that he's throwing 95% of the time or whatever, 93% of the time. And the changeup isn't very good, um, the other 7%. So, like, yeah, he's got whiff stuff, but this is a bullpen arsenal, and he gives up a lot of power. So when he is off... He can get blown apart, and it can the wheels can fall off real quickly. So uh, I think getting to the Yankees is fine, again, if you want to take shots here. And correlated teams with Cole and the Yankees, you got some cheap Yankees pieces. Ozzy Peraza, 2,600, got a lot of pop. Uh, Ozzy Cabrera, 2,500, got some pop from both sides. Josie Trevino behind the plate, uh, that, that's fine to play, 2,500. Could be Hicks today, who knows? But uh, IKF, not so much in the pop department, a little more of a contact hitter. But you can get to a Volpe leading off at 3,800 or a DJ, despite not being a traditional four hitter. He's 3,700 in the four hole. That's fine. Um, Rizzo's only 44. So if you want to play some Yankee stacks, uh, you've got the cheap pieces that can help you build around the Aaron Judge at 63. So uh, fine to get to. The Yankees here, they might be a little bit off the board given the ownership that's likely to come in on the Mets, the Twins, 
and Baltimore. So uh, they could be, I'm not sure off the top of my head, but they could be a uh, four stack in terms of ownership on the board here for you. And that could be a, a decent tournament play. Um, so matchups wise, that's it. Uh, we like Cole, obviously. Uh, we like a little bit of the Yankees, and we certainly like Detroit and some Kyle Gibson. Probably no, um, or Baltimore and Kyle Gibson. Probably no Joey Wentz from Detroit. Maybe some Detroit bats here against Kyle Gibson. This is a five-gamer. You can you can get real weird if you want to. You can play some Washington against Joey Lucchese. He's not a 1.2, 1.3 K an inning guy. Um, he might pick apart Washington, but these guys have been striking out very little here in the early going. Trevor Williams probably know, like the Mets a good bit, but everybody's going to like the Mets here tonight. Tampa and the White Sox, mostly pitching, of course, with McClanahan and Cease here. But if you want to get to an off-the-board tournament stack, I'd prefer Tampa. Uh, but you could get to the White Sox. Like, they've, they're very, very cheap. If you want to get to a Cole and, uh, like, a Tyler Molly or something, the White Sox can get you there. Um, Kansas City and Minnesota, no Grinky, of course. There's never any Grinky. Really like Tyler Molly, and I'll probably have some twins again, and I'll probably just be paying the rake. Uh, Yankees in Texas, we talked about. Like, give me, give me some of the Yankees, and um, and and a lot of Garrett Cole. You know, I, I think the 11-2 is going to prevent us uh, from getting all of Garrett Cole, but 45% is. Probably a low number given this medium projection so far. Super high value score for both he, Luke, I mean, really all of these guys. These are big value score numbers given these medium projections. So likely to see some pretty good pitching performances on the mound tonight. Uh, but in tournaments, if you want to get super contrarian with it, target some of these guys and you can go after them. Uh, if you want to play some bad teams like some Detroit <laughs> or uh, or some Washington, something like that, I think it's reasonable. Probably less enthused about like a Kansas City, but um, everybody is in play here on a, on a short five gamer. So uh, that's it for the breakdowns on Thursday. We'll be back tomorrow for a what's likely to be a, a large Friday slate once again. Good luck.